If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Phil, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at the Square. And I think maybe there's seats for everybody. If not, there's some little bit of room up front. Um, and before I uh, dive into my teaching today, just want to stop and and just bring honor uh, to to our moms and to honor Mother's Day. And uh, we actually hold this really sacred. We we believe in there's such a significance. Uh, in the life of moms and uh, a joy to be able to take time today to honor them. But we also recognize that every time that we come towards honoring and celebrating, there are just so many different stories in the room. And I just wanted to, to tell you today that it could be on a day like Mother's Day that uh, it's, it's a point of loss for the loss of your mother or the loss of relationship with your mother. It could be the deep pain of wanting and longing to be a mom and that not occurring in our lives. And like many families and women in our church that we, Emily and I, have also experienced of the pain of losing children uh, in the process of trying to have children and the ache of being a mom of kids you never met. And so today, I just want you to know that no matter where uh, you experience Mother's Day, we love you. Jesus sees you. Whether it awakens uh, hardship in the midst of joy, you're just loved and valued and honored. And we just want to bring that uh, significance to you today. And we also recognize that mothering is, is something that, while it's put on display uh, so powerfully and rightly in actually being a biological mom, that it is also such a powerful picture in the heart of all women that who labor to cultivate life. And I want to say this to you today, whether you are a physical mom or not, the power of what it means to be a woman in Jesus who contends to bring life, who long suffering and laboring to cultivate life in community and life in others is one of the greatest gifts you carry. And I just celebrate and honor that in you today. And so may you just know you are deeply known and loved and seen. And of course, for the moms in the room, we just wanna take a minute and we wanna honor you. So if you are here and you are a mom, would you stand and we wanna honor you and we have a rose that we wanna give you and just express our love and thankfulness to you. And go ahead and stay standing. I love it. I know it's always, it's always awkward to be the last mom who gets a rose. So the last mom gets two roses. So listen, just hang in there and uh, we see you. Um, just really love you today. I, I, my, my heart is carrying so many of the, just the unique realities of our, of our church family. And once you get your rose, you can go ahead and be seated. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> Um, I love, uh, and, and I want to, uh, you know, just even specifically, uh, my, own, uh, my wife will be at the next service, but honor my sister, Jenny, who's a remarkable mom, and my aunt, Shelly, who's such a, a mom in my life. I love you very much. And, um, and my mom, you know, uh, shaped my life. Uh, I, I've told you this many times. There's, uh, you know, nearly every morning of my life, I would wake up to my mom doing devotions. She cultivated a life of intimacy with God and, and genuinely pass that along to me. And then, of course, moments that only moms can stumble into. I remember walking into practice uh, in baseball. I think it was, it was my junior year, uh, junior year in high school. And my coach pulls me aside and goes, your mom called. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, this is not good. And, um, and he's like, yeah, she was pretty frustrated with me. Like, are, you, are, we, are we okay? Then apparently my mom uh, didn't think I was getting enough playing time. And, uh, you know... <laughs> Put in that mom call. There's nothing like trying to find your way as a man as your mom calling your coach. And um, I think my mom's probably watching the live stream. Mama, I love you very much. Uh, we've worked through that moment. Uh, I'll take it every time, actually. The, 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 the heart of moms to come in and love and cover. Just honor you today. Hope you have an amazing day. Today, I want to just uh, speak uh, as, we, as we continue to navigate through Psalm 23. And two weeks ago, we started this teaching series and this invitation that something around this psalm is, is actually inviting us into this unique vision of life. Jesus is our shepherd, and there's a promise attached to this hope, which is that when Jesus takes the role of our lives as truly the shepherd who's leading us, there is a life that lacks nothing. 
But again, it is not a vision of a life that has everything. In fact, it's, it's learning that the true fulfillment of life will never be found by trying to acquire all that we long to acquire, but the fulfillment that you were made for was union with your maker. And it is Jesus, our shepherd, who leads us into this life that lacks nothing in the midst of challenges, no matter what they are. And in, in many ways, this part of the psalm that we're looking at today is, is easily the most significant part of the psalm and is right in the heart, right? It's, it's the passage about uh, God uh, leading us through valleys of shadows of death. And we have to understand that the way David places this in the poem, that the way he structures this poem is he's trying to invite us into this identity. God is a shepherd. He's giving us a picture we can hold on to. He, in many ways, writes this poem so that in the heart of it, in this line, really is the most distinct invitation. It, this is the portion of the psalm where if we could truly trust God as our shepherd, where every other part of the psalm emerges. It isn't until we learn to trust Jesus to take us the places we don't want to go, that we become people who really allow Jesus to be our shepherd into a way that leads to a life that lacks nothing. And this, this line, let me read Psalm 23 to you. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And in, today in this distinct line, even though I walk through the darkest valley, or many of our translations would say, even though I walk through the valleys of shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What does it mean to let Jesus teach us how to walk through shadows and valleys? And in many ways, what I want to talk to you today about is Jesus and courage. That Jesus, your shepherd, wants to give you courage to walk into the places that you fear the most. And this picture, right, I mean, even, even how David writes a psalm, I will fear no evil, because what he knows is that the imagery of walking into these valleys, what they do is they awaken fear in our lives. And I was even thinking recently, this is a story I shared once many, many years ago, but the, 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 what, the power of what fear does in our lives. When I was younger, uh, and I, I've, I've never liked scary movies, never enjoyed scary movies, even movies that are not like horror movies but are too intense, not, not a fan. Like, if I'm going to watch it, my life, my real life has too many complications. If you're not gonna make me laugh, I'm not gonna really take the time, right? That's, that's me in entertainment. It's gotta make me laugh. I, I, I don't have time to deal with the emotions made by a fake movie, right? That's just, that's just where, where I'm at. That's, uh, I, uh, I don't watch dramas, I don't watch, I don't like, but I, re I don't like scary movies. And, uh, but you know, in high school, peer pressure, all of those things, I remember it was my junior year in high school again two stories out of my junior year. there you go that's for you Trev and uh, we 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 actually I uh, had a group of friends that decided they were going to watch a movie called the Blair Witch Project and, uh, and some of you are are too young to remember the, the, the value of this but this was the pre-internet days I, I didn't own a computer didn't have the internet in my house had no cell phones and the buzz around this movie was that it was a real thing somebody found these tapes in the wood and there was this whole marketing campaign around like like maybe this is real and I lived in Idaho where we were a little more gullible to such things. And, and, um, and I remember, I, like, you have that like, maybe, I don't know, but the whole film. And, and my, I, I grew up in small town Idaho where a lot of my friends kind of lived farther out into just the rural areas. And I had a friend who had set up like an outdoor projector and we watched the Blair Witch Project. And I was dying the entire time, right? But I was also trying to impress girls, I imagine. And so I was hanging in there trying to, to be, and I, I mean, I was terrified. I mean, literally like, like, like I, I, at the very end, I, I made some excuse why I had to leave really quickly because I was, my, my voice was, like, I was scared, right? Was, this movie did not sit well with me. And I got in my car and it was an, an Idaho summer. And, and you, know, you know when you're driving, and uh, just in certain conditions, like there's a sewer uh, 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 
manhole cover, thank you, uh, in the road. And, and like steam in certain conditions can be coming out of it. Well, I'm like driving home and I'm driving fast, country road, and I'm just, I just am beelining it to get home. And my light beams catch this little bit of steam that was coming out of the ground. And this is the power of fear. In this moment, as my lights catch this beam, my mind takes over and about a hundred yards from me is the Blair Witch, right? <laughs> and I'm not telling you, I didn't see light, I saw her. I shriek at the top of my lungs. I scream. And you know when you're like, this is like the only visual, when you're in these moments where you think you're, like people get into accidents and you try to like push on the, the brakes, but you actually just slam on the gas. That's what I did. I tried to slam on the brakes. I slam on the grass, the, the gas. I, I, I end up going up to like, I mean, I, and, I fly, and I think I'm about to be eaten, right? Like this is, this is, I am terrified. I fly through this little bit of steam. I get onto the other side and like my heart is racing. My legs are just, and I'm like suddenly realizing that was just steam. That was just steam. The, the Blair Witch isn't real. Like, Phil, the Blair Witch isn't real. I pull over to the side of the road and I'm like, okay, okay. I turn on all the lights in my car and instantly like turn on Christian music, <laughs> right? I'm like, this will solve the problem. And um, I drive, I drive home. I was the, my older brother and sister had already moved out of the house. And, and I walk in and then literally that night, like I just go downstairs. I turn on all the lights. I turned on cartoons. I, I feel like I needed to, you know, turn the entertainment but I remember that, that fear, it was so real in me, right? It was just overwhelming in these moments. But, but I, I like this story because what, what it helps us indicate, and this is what fear does, is fear becomes something that actually takes circumstances and vivifies them with a different kind of life. And I don't know if you've ever uh, been driving and imagined a witch was about to eat you. I, I, my guess is that's a pretty unique story to me. But what I doubt is unique is how many times in our lives something has awoken fear and that fear suddenly takes shape of something greater than is actually there. And I think the reason why you and I, in the midst of seasons of this picture of walking through valleys of darkness, why we have to come to this place of what will we do with our fear is not only because it awakens it, but often because we have never lived lives that learn how to navigate their way through fear. Fear takes on a character far greater than it actually is. And I believe Jesus, our shepherd, wants to teach us how to actually walk through life in the places we've been trying to avoid. And even this phrase, right, the darkest valley, which is in our translation, the NIV, or other translations would commonly say the valleys of the shadows of death. I want to show you a picture of what this would have meant for them. Again, David is writing this as a shepherd who becomes king. He's very familiar with, with these rhythms and these ways of life. And, and when we're talking about a, a shepherd who would lead people through valleys, he's, he's talking about moments like this. That, that as a shepherd navigating this life, you were going to commonly find yourself in places where the only way to where you needed to go was going to be walking through caverns and valleys. And you can see, even in the daytime, how filled it is with shadows that begin to creep over. But imagine as a shepherd is navigating his way through, darkness begins to set, no modern technology, and all you have is simply the, the stars in the sky and whatever fire you have uh, made in your own hand. That, that, that you have to lead your way through these caverns. And even when you look at this word, this psalmeth, psalmeth that, that, that gets the, translated as deep shadow, dark shadow, shadow of death, really it's from these two words, sel and maveth, and, and the most literal meaning is, is just kind of this idea of a, of a shade of death that begins to come over. And when you think about what, what David is trying to articulate, that there are, there are moments where you find yourself needing to navigate through something you haven't been through before or a place you're uncertain about. And it's not just that you're uncertain, it's that this shadow begins to creep. This shade of death begins to cover over. And for a shepherd, actually, 
these places were places of great danger. Interestingly enough, the greatest danger that a shepherd would actually face in a valley or a cavern like this would be flash floods. Not, not fully aware in Israel, you have all of these, these, these hills and these mountainsides, and it was very easy for it to rain on one side and not on another, and for it to shift just simply based on the winds, which can shift very easily uh, in the Israeli countryside. And, and so the, the, the ability to go, I'm going to step into this, and who knows what I'm going to face on the other side. And then, of course, wolves and mountain lions and all of the, the, the animals that are there that we have to remember, sheep have no ability to defend themselves from anything, let alone predators that are coming after them. And, and this picture, as much as it speaks to the reality of facing the greatest kinds of loss, which is the loss of loved ones, certainly it speaks to these valleys of incredible suffering. It's not simply trying to speak of what is in front of us when it comes to death. It's actually trying to speak to the reality of all of us facing vulnerabilities. The reality of this, uh, you can go back to that picture, the reality of walking through this valley is this valley is where you're most vulnerable. This valley is where you're least protected. This valley is where you're most at potential harm. And when David invites us into this psalm, he is saying that you and I, if we are going to trust Jesus as our shepherd, are going to have to learn how to finally trust Jesus with the greatest vulnerabilities. And friends, if we're honest, our greatest vulnerabilities are the places we've been trying to avoid the most. And until we come to the place where Jesus is actually the shepherd who's navigating the greatest awakened fears inside of us, then, then Jesus is not our shepherd. This is why at the heart of the poem is an invitation because those who allow Jesus to lead them through deathly valleys, shadowy valleys, difficult circumstances, are those who in every other place of life learn to yield to Jesus as shepherd. And see, the challenge is, is the minute you find yourself in these circumstances, what does it do? Is it, it provokes fear. And if you remember the original story of Adam and Eve, who, who when, when, when the humans fell, when Adam and Eve entered in and chose sin rather than union with God and the curse breaks out into the world, what is the immediate thing that happens? They're afraid, they hide, they're filled with shame. They try to cover themselves. They can't adequately. God has to be the one who comes and covers, and they blame. Rather than owning the, their own story, they, they shift it on each other. And this is this universal pattern of what sin and death and darkness has done in humanity. We find ourselves in places that we are afraid, and the minute we get afraid, suddenly this response comes in, and we want to hide. We want to uh, let shame tell us the truth, and we want to blame anybody but ourselves. And what I've learned is that most of us have learned how to do this and wrap Christian language around it. Rather than actually seeing at the end of the day, you and I have a decision to make. When we enter into the place where we have to walk through valleys, who is going to be our shepherd? Who is going to lead the way? And my great pain is that I think so many of us have normalized the shepherd of fear and shame. And I'm just telling you that Jesus wants to teach you how to navigate a life where you are no longer shepherded by the very things that are trying to destroy you. This is what God has for us. I love this quote, Kenneth Bailey. He's writing a book called The Good Shepherd about Psalm 23. And he says, the valley of death, deep darkness, is a section of the trail that cannot be avoided. There's no bypass road, no magical escape. The only way forward is through the valley. The only way forward is through the valley. Friends, trusting Jesus 
as our shepherd is allowing him to lead us in all of the places we choose to avoid. And this is why I believe this grows for us. Because when you and I try to live lives that rather than choosing to navigate through the valley, we try to figure out a way around the valley. It's almost like that childhood fear of a boogeyman in a door. And the fear grows and creates a reality that doesn't actually exist. And I see this happening within us because we want to buy into this idea of autonomy, because we want to buy into this idea, I can face valleys and find another way around them on my own. I'm going to navigate a life that is free from pain, that is free from suffering, and certainly is not going to walk into my vulnerabilities. What you do is you create in the midst of your vulnerabilities a fear that takes on a life that was never meant to be. Because what you don't know is when you try to avoid fear and when you try to avoid vulnerability, what you actually do is you let insidious realities of the enemy come and it fills your fear with accusations against you. So what happens when we normalize never actually stepping into the places we're most vulnerable is we actually hand over our vulnerabilities to the enemy. And then he adds to our vulnerabilities his accusatory hatred against us. And that's when you get really afraid because you don't know how to discern the difference between fear, which sometimes fear is very normal and logical and not disobedient. Guys, courage is not the absence of fear, right? We've said this so many times. Courage is choosing in the midst of fear to trust Jesus and step in. But what happens when we avoid fear, when we avoid pain, is we can't discern the difference between fear I need to entrust to Jesus and the voice voice of the enemy against our soul who fills that fear with so much hatred and accusation that suddenly we cannot discern the difference between the two. And then what we become really, truly afraid of is the accusations against us. And it causes us to halt and to stop. And see, this is why we have to learn how to allow Jesus to be the one who navigates us through vulnerabilities. Y'all, there's a a reason uh, I know what I know about you and you know what you know about me, right? That passage where it talks about that day when we encounter Jesus face to face when in, in, in the, the culmination of all things and Jesus is returned that we will, we will know as we are fully known, the beautiful reality that Jesus fully knows us right here, right now. But can I tell you, trying to step into being fully known among each other is difficult. Why? Because I already tell you what I want you to know about me, and you already tell me what you want me to know about you. You want to know what's left of the fully knowing? Everything I don't want you to know. And what's left on our other side is everything you don't want everybody else to know. See, what happens is because we have these vulnerabilities and we've never learned to entrust God with them, and then they get filled with those accusations, and then the lies come in. If people really knew blank, they would do blank. If I actually exposed my, if I became fully known here, I would be rejected. If I became fully known here, I would be abandoned. If I became fully known, and suddenly it is actually the accusatory nature of the enemy filled in the vacuum of our fears, which robs us from a life of courage to follow Jesus. Guys, what we have to recognize is Jesus is the only remedy for our fears. There there is no other answer for what you're afraid of than the person in the presence of Jesus. This is what Jesus tried to teach his disciples over and over and over again. The only place safe in fear is in his presence. And even that incredible story, Jesus on the ocean or on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, the storm's raging, they're convinced they're going to die. And by the way, if they're convinced they're going to die, they probably weren't wrong. These are incredible, these are experienced fishermen. These are not weak men. These are men that have been in storms. And Jesus is asleep in the boat. Of course, they cry out. Jesus stands up, he calms the winds and the sea. It's this incredible moment. But, but what, I, what, I, what we often feel in that story, right, is Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. And again, I just want to tell you this to you. Jesus is not asleep in the back of the boat because he is not concerned about you because he's happy to let hard things happen to you. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat because the storms that wake you up don't wake him up. But what we have to remember is one thing does wake him up, your cries. 
See, Jesus isn't indifferent to the trials we walk through. Jesus isn't indifferent to the storms that we experience. You don't want a Jesus who's in much panic about the storms as you are. This is the beauty of Jesus. You're convinced it's all about to fall apart and he's asleep. Because the storms don't wake him. They have no authority over him. But your voice does. When you cry out, God, help me. That's when God responds. We have to see the beauty of what happens when we trust Jesus. We have to learn how to trust Jesus in the valley. And trusting Jesus in the valley is trusting Jesus with all of your vulnerabilities. And friends, one of the greatest lies I've bought into, right? We, We talk about transparency, vulnerability. Like certainly you cannot be vulnerable without being transparent. It would be impossible, but you can certainly be transparent without being vulnerable. And as a pastor, one of the greatest arts I've learned accidentally is how to be transparent, but never vulnerable. Because being vulnerable actually means being woundable and helpable. If you can't be wounded and you can't be helped, you're not being vulnerable. You might be transparent, but Jesus didn't invite you into transparency. He invited you to trust him in vulnerability where you actually have the ability for things to hurt you and for things to help you because you have entrusted your life to Jesus, your shepherd, and not to you. And so God is saying he's navigating this life that is trying to teach you courage in the midst of what makes you afraid. But how? Well, David answers, right? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And it's here in this picture that David actually doesn't only just teach us about something about the character of God, he teaches us something about the ways of God. Right, he speaks to these two things, the shepherd's rod and the shepherd's staff. These would have been two tools that were in the hands of every shepherd. Let me show them to you. First, the rod. This is what it uh, would look like. It was like an ancient club, and this was for one thing, for beating things. That's what it was for. But what you have to understand is... This was not a tool for the sheep. Just let me make this incredibly clear to you. Shepherds don't have tools to beat sheep. It's not a tool in the tool belt of a shepherd. Shepherds don't beat sheep. In fact, the beating that took place, Jesus already took on your behalf. He doesn't have a beating left to give. Like we have to remember, sometimes we, we, we know that our shepherd carries a rod. And I think we, again, we buy into the lies of the accuser against us. And we try to navigate these paths. Just, just uh, I can navigate this path if I'm obedient enough, if I'm perfect enough, if I'm blank, because we're afraid that Jesus is about to pull out his rod. He doesn't use his rod against you. He doesn't have a club to beat you with, but he does have one and he does use it if you'd let him. It's a, it's a club that is meant to defend and protect the sheep against the very enemies that would come against it. Jesus has a club. I'm just telling you, you and I, don't ever let Jesus come and use it because we want him to use it against people. (laughs) Jesus, can you take this club and just start smacking some people around? But can I tell you, the enemies that are robbing you from living in a life of flourishing are not the people around you. It's the lies you've normalized against you. And until we actually see that the Jesus of new creation has a club. By the way, shepherds, they would take this and they would actually like, uh, you know, take ancient kind of forms of tar or, or glue or things and they would stick shards and rocks because the point was, I'm gonna take a swing and I'm gonna make this thing bleed. Like if you're coming after my sheep, I'm gonna do everything I can to convince you to run the other way. This was a club that was dangerous. I wanna remind you that Jesus has a club with shards and rocks and st- He's ready to take some swings against the lies, if you'll let him. Jesus, your shepherd, is trying to walk you through a dark valley, if you'll let him. But it's not just that he has a rod. He has a staff as well, and you can see this. I found a picture, just a kind of a modern sh- shepherd, but you can see this, this walking stick, and certainly shepherds would have used it as a walking stick, but uniquely the shepherd's crook, right? The staff would have had this shape at the end because this was a tool that the shepherd used, and this was a tool specifically for the care of the sheep. And, and, and David says it's, it's your staff 
that comforts me. And this is true. The presence of the shepherd's staff is the presence of comfort for sheep. Again, a shepherd doesn't use this violently against his sheep. In fact, the only maybe forceful time a shepherd would ever use this is if, like, like the video I showed a couple of weeks ago, a, a sheep that is actually in peril that the sheep needs to, the shepherd needs to pull up back into safety. But again, let me, let me show you what the staff does because the, the shepherd would have used the staff for three things, for correction, for guidance, and for community. So a sheep who's wandering off, and you remember you saw those paths from several weeks ago, so many options to take, and every once in a while a sheep will go to the left or the right. The shepherd would simply take his staff and nudge the sheep back into the direction they're trying to go. It, a form of correction, but a correction that's compassion. A shepherd who's teaching sheep to go in the direction of life and flourishing. But then it's not just about correction, it's about guidance. I mean, if you go back to the image of the cavern in the valley, you can imagine what would happen. This, this would happen. Sheep would get to points. You're walking through a valley. It gets dark. You literally can't see the way. So what do you do? You stop. Fear fills the environment. You are afraid. I cannot see the way forward. So what would the shepherd do? He would take his crook and he would just nudge. I know the way, this is the way. And when the shepherd would nudge, the sheep would know the direction to go and they would follow. The shepherd would guide. It's a picture of guidance. But it's also what a shepherd knows is the most dangerous place for any sheep to be is alone. So even if you were in a safe place and a shepherd would want, or a sheep would wander off to eat or graze alone, a shepherd would come and he would take his staff and he would corral them back into community because he was always trying to teach the sheep that they were safest when they were together. And I want you to think about these three pictures and Lynn's and Matt, you can come up, I'm gonna close. Correction, guidance, and community. That Jesus, our shepherd, is trying to navigate life with us like this. And that this life is filled with comfort. Comfort is found when we yield to Jesus's correction as an act of his compassion. Comfort is found when we allow the voice of Jesus to inform our decisions. Comfort is found when we trust the community the shepherd has put us within. And I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna say that this also has a, a really practical invitation if you're willing to receive it. Think of something that awakens vulnerability. You don't have to say it out loud right now, right? But just, just hold that in your heart. Something that awakens vulnerability. So what, what we've normalized is that vulnerability is to be avoided. So we start immediately going, what's the path around this where I don't have to walk through this? Rather than actually going, man, when actually an awakened vulnerability comes and fear comes with it, I get to do four things. I got to first and foremost go to Jesus and go, what lies want to come in the midst of this vulnerability? And then Jesus, my shepherd, club in hand, gets to come and have his way against my enemies, the accuser of my soul. There's no longer any accusation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Guys, I would love for us to believe that again. Could you let Jesus, your shepherd, come and stand against the enemies of accusation that vulnerabilities awake. Then I take my vulnerability and I've let Jesus, my shepherd, stand against lies. And then I take my vulnerability and I, I submit it to the word of God. And if it needs any correcting, maybe sometimes I'm vulnerable because I'm wrong <laughs> or I'm arrogant or I've missed something, but I let the word of God nudge me to the left or to the right, guy, compassionately. I've never been corrected by Jesus and felt unloved. That's wild. Only Jesus can do that. But then I take, and then, and then I take that vulnerability and I, sometimes I don't know what to do. Oh, but man, I spent time with Jesus and I go, I need to know. And the Holy Spirit begins to nudge in a direction. And I take that vulnerability and I, I bring it in front of community. And I allow the body of Christ filled with the spirit of God 
to speak into this. I'm telling you, if when you got vulnerable, you let Jesus go against the lies, you let the word of God invite you into truth, you allowed the Holy Spirit to give you guidance, and you let community speak courage to you through the power of encouragement through the Holy Spirit, what you would find is you might be a little afraid, but I'm telling you, all the boogeymen attached to your fear aren't as real as you think they are. And suddenly, courage would wake up. Courage to walk through valleys. Courage to walk through hardship. Courage to walk through vulnerabilities. Courage to walk through the places you've been avoiding. Because in the midst of that, you find that Jesus, your shepherd, isn't simply the one who knows the way. He's trying to wake up in you the courage to live a life of trust with him because we live in a city that is terrified. Absolutely terrified. And what they need is a church of enough courage to be vulnerable but vulnerable in the presence of God, vulnerable led by the spirit of Jesus, vulnerable willing to go, I will enter into the places I'm afraid of because I actually have a greater confidence in my shepherd than I do with me. At the, two weeks ago, at the beginning of my teaching series, I told you, um, you know, this moment in 2020 where God began to speak in to this in a new way, where an invitation to Jesus as my shepherd in a way I had never known before started, where this teaching series actually started to be written in practically even in my life. And it was this fear of a shadowy valley. And if you remember, I, I, but the prayer I prayed to God was, you have to protect you have to protect our church. But Jesus knew that's not actually what I was praying. He was saying, there has to be another way through than this. I, I cannot go through this valley. Why? Because unknowingly in that valley was my vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities I'd been hiding from vulnerabilities I'd been trusting myself with. And the fact that I hadn't taken my vulnerabilities and offered them into the presence of Jesus, they vivified with accusation. So you can't lead through that valley. You don't know the way through that valley. Even if you do know the way through the valley, nobody's gonna be there on the other side of that valley. Even if you can make it through the valley, you're gonna be so broken and wounded, you're gonna have nothing to offer anyone on the other side. Suddenly, all of my vulnerabilities, which, what are they? Fear of rejection, fear of inadequacy, fear of not being enough, fear of being left, you know, normal stuff we all feel. I realized because of years and years and years of navigating a life around my vulnerabilities, I had filled those vulnerabilities with the accusations of the enemy. And see, here's the dangerous part of the accusations of the enemy. Sometimes they're true. Sometimes the enemy can speak things. Remember that, Phil? Remember that bad decision 10 years ago? It's not lying. <laughs> and suddenly the accuser of the church fills the vacuum of your fear in undealt with vulnerabilities. And Jesus met me there. And this is, you know, there's a song by Shannon Shane called Embracing Accusations that was such a, like a, a ministry of God to me in that season. Because the turning point was realizing in the, everywhere I was afraid, the enemy was accusing me. Oh man, and it was overwhelming. But then I started to trust Jesus, my shepherd. And you want to know what I found out? The enemy can't accuse Jesus. 
that suddenly every time the enemy said, you can't do this, I started to go, oh, that's all he can say. That's all he can say because he, he knows the truth. It's not whether I can do this or not. It's that Jesus is sufficient to do what he called me to do. Jesus is sufficient to fulfill his promises. Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my future. Jesus is my authority. Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my life. I don't actually have to be anything apart from him. I get to be in him and filled with life because he's enough. And suddenly every accusation that started to come against me filled me with courage because I learned the enemy has one trick to convince me of my own incapability. But when my confidence is not in my capability, but in the Lord my God who does not fear valleys, Oh, courage started to wake up. Courage started to wake up. Because in me, in me is not simply me. In me is Christ, my Redeemer, who's filled me with resurrection power and who can navigate valleys I cannot on my own. I do not need to be my own shepherd. I do not need to be perfect. I actually just get to be vulnerable with the one who knows the way. And now I've learned that when I get afraid, Jesus gets close. I'm telling you, victory is wherever the presence of Jesus is. I'm done being safe, safe in my mind, outside of the valley walls. And I've learned that where I want to be, where I'm called to be, who I was made to be, is somebody who walks through valleys of shadows of death and I will fear no evil because I've got a shepherd who's got a club who is just standing against the enemy of my soul and I've got a shepherd with a with a staff who's okay when I nudge a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right because he I trust him and he navigates me and when I stop and I go I don't know the way through that but I start to learn the nudge of his Holy Spirit And I find my way forward. And when I start to find myself alone, which we all can do, and then the Holy Spirit's like, oh, come on. Come on back to people. I think that there's a revelation that God wants to give. That Jesus, our shepherd, is really enough. That Jesus, our shepherd, has everything that we need. Doesn't mean it won't be hard. Doesn't mean... It won't provoke or awaken fears or vulnerabilities. But I'm telling you that when you fully trust Jesus, your shepherd, you start to catch the mystery of life in him, by him, through him, for him. My confidence is in him and the power of new creation and what he's placed in me. And I get to humble myself and let my shepherd lead. And as I learn to do it over and over and over again, then I get the confidence to walk with others. And it's even just the power of this passage. If you wanna stand with me, we're we're just gonna close. I wanna just ask that the Holy Spirit would meet us in this place before I send you out in this last moment of worship. But this, this, this verse in 1 Peter, almost carries such a similar heartbeat as Psalm 23. And this is what it says. Humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand, so at the proper time he might exalt you. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. I'm telling you, there's a promise of Jesus, your shepherd in the valley. It is the place where God, by his might, does these four things. And I'm telling you, you were made for them. It's time to run to valleys. It's time to run to vulnerabilities. It's trying to run into fears. 
Because when you begin to learn who Jesus is in the midst of them, this is what he's going to do. He's going to restore you. He's going to confirm you. He's going to strengthen you. Oh, guys, and this is what we ache for. He is going to establish you on a firm foundation that no thing can move, no storm can move, no accusation can move, no thing has authority over because you are built on the foundation that survives storms. Come on, would we just, in this moment, I want us just to close in this act of worship, but here's my request. As we just sing out love and honor to Jesus, would you, would you let Jesus, your shepherd, invite you into the places you fear the most? Would you be willing to, to, to navigate it with him, to yield and to let Jesus give you courage? Father, come and help us. Help us as we navigate the mazes of life in Jesus' name. Come on, church, let's just close in a moment of worship. And I've seen the darkest valley And I've drank the cup of suffering But you always stay till the morning Like you said you would do You're worthy of hallelujah Every season of my life so I live to testify that God, you are good, so good. And I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. So that I have is a hallelujah. for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah, I throw my hands, praise you again and again, so that I have is a hallelujah. So Jesus, we just come to you today and we get into alignment with who you are. We thank you, Jesus, that this is true. That there is now, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That, that we, God, get to stand in confidence and in joy of the work of your hands. That what you have done in us is enough. And God, we dream of the day of an awakened heart that trusts you with everything. Lord, would you come and do this work by the power of your spirit. Lord, anyone here who's just, has just faced the accusations of their soul, that fears have partnered with lies. I'm praying right now in the name of Jesus for the authority of the mind of Christ to step in and speak to the truth of our adopted identity in Jesus. For courage, power, strength, and honor. Come and have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have another service in eight minutes. That's my fault, y'all. That's my fault. Listen, doesn't matter. We can start late. If we can pray for you, Please let us come and pray. Listen, may God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance to you. And may you know everywhere you go today, you're radically loved by Jesus. God bless you, friends. Have a great day. Happy Mother's Day.